All right. Well, good morning. I'm going to hand it over to uh, Greta Hilton, who's our Associate Commissioner of our office this morning, to give our welcome. All right. Good morning. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I just wanted to swing by this morning uh, virtually and say um, thank you for all the work that you're doing to um, promote and advocate for gifted and talented services and our students and families across the Commonwealth. Um, as you know, this is a big charge, um, the responsibility of the councils to make recommendations to the department regarding um, services for students with gifted and talented. And that's um, that's not a charge to be taken lightly. And I know this group does this actively and it does it well. And so I just want to um, want to want to say thank you for that um, as a parent of a child who received gifted and talented services back in the day. Um, we won't talk about how old he is because it'll reveal how old I am. Um, it was um, it, it was it was quite interesting. He, um, you know, as a child, didn't realize how important it was initially. Um, then later, um, I would argue that it changed the trajectory of his life. Um, he was a student who went to the Craft Academy. Um, he's a very young person today and is getting his master's in business. Um, and so, you know, I honestly, I think it was the provision of these services that helped to boost that along. And for those of you that know him well, know that he was a twice exceptional student, which um, makes it kind of even more near and dear to my heart from a personal level when I look at the numbers across the state and um, realize that we, you know, we're seeing an increase or at least have this past year of the students who are twice exceptional who are receiving gifted and talented services. And I just think that's incredible um, um, that we recognize all of our talents for all of our students. And um, the increase in numbers, Melody, I think is going to talk a little more about um, the, you know, the funding and that sort of thing. But it's really nice to be able to look at numbers, especially post COVID and see increases in students who are receiving services, um, particularly students um, who are, you know, may be otherwise um, disadvantaged, whether it's students with IEPs or students um, who are economically disadvantaged. Um, and again, I know that is primarily because of, you know, first and foremost, the support of families, parents, um, our local districts and our leaders, and then also this council and the work that you do each and every day um, within your districts with families and behind the scenes. And so please just know that that does not go unnoticed. And um, I just wanted to say thank you for all the hard work that you put into this. Thank you, Greta. Really appreciate your welcome and your comments this morning. Thank you. So now we're going to hand it over to Misty and Misty is going to go over the meeting norms. Okay, thank you, Ms. Kathy. Good morning, everyone. Um, members must speak when called on for roll call or any voting. Just a reminder to stay focused on the topic agenda at hand for the sake of time. Additional feedback is provided through the meeting exit slip. And the secretary, Ms. Lindsay Burton, she will take notes and Misty will store and manage those documents for you. OK, thank you. All right, Dr. Roberts, we're going to turn it over to you to take the roll call um, and then members will say if they're here or not for a um, charting of that. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you, Greta, and thank you, Misty. It takes all of us putting um, a good meeting together. So I'll call roll and it's written kind of small. So I'm going to have the sheet right in front of me. Katie Booth. Shandidra Bradford. Lindsay Burton. Kimberly Code. Here. Randy Corbett. I'm here, sorry. Paul Lynn Covington. Here. Byron Darnell. Mason Dyer. 
Hannah England. Here. Kirk mm -hmm. Haynes. Jessica Hastings. Philip Cash. Jean Lee. Tiffany Marshall. Bran Martin. Here. Harry Ballinger. Julia Roberts here. Kim Nettleton. Here. And Jennifer Fraker. Okay, that thank is, you, Dr. Roberts. That is the role. All right, so we've got seven people here. So hopefully we'll have three more show up later on. All right, so uh, Next, we've got a review and approval of the February minutes. Those were sent out to you guys beforehand. So um, does anybody see anything that they need to have corrected there? I did not. Okay. All right. If not, then um, we can move on to the next agenda item which is our priorities and recommendations. So Dr. Roberts, I'm gonna let you. So when we met the last time, and these times seem so far apart to me, mm -hmm. do they to you? I have to review the minutes and make sure I realize just exactly where we are with this. So mm -hmm. the priorities, I have them on a sheet right I've here. also got them up on the um, oh, PowerPoint slide there, Dr. Good, good. Robert. I hadn't noticed that, thanks. That's okay, I just so, moved it there, so. So for the first one, develop a formal annual budget request for increased funding. Um, I'm gonna provide just a little background information on that. Um, as you all know, two years ago, gifted received the first bump in funding that we'd had in decades and that's a serious comment decades and it came to 10 million and um, primarily advocating through the kentucky association for gifted education we had hoped to boost that this year but that did not come about in the final budget that this House and Senate passed. So developing a formal annual budget request for funding is probably something we ought to start now for, of course, the legislature won't have a new budget for two years, but if there's anything I know about advocacy, it, it's you don't start when it's time for the legislature to meet. You plant the seeds and you talk with key folks and you try and build that. So it would seem to me that our priority is um, pretty important. And uh, under that, we had some recommendations, but for the moment, I'll, I'll stick with what we have right here as the key recommendations. The second one being to educate teachers and parents on the identification of recommendations for students showing gifted and talented characteristics. And if you remember, uh, initially that was looking at one area of giftedness. When we talked the last time, it was expanded to look at the various areas of giftedness and to educate more educators and parents on what's really involved. And the third priority is to support equitable funding for all socioeconomic geographic groups and districts in our state. I believe we voted on these the last time. Is that correct, Kathy? So that that's correct. We did, so, Dr. Roberts. And then so, we uh, discussed recommendations, which I'm going to display here in just a second. And uh, it was asked that we, you know, put these into a Google Doc for people to make any kind of edits or comments or questions on. And that was done. I didn't receive any uh, comments or questions on these. 
um, by the due date of Tuesday, but I'll go ahead and put these up here and display them. Let me just stop sharing this particular screen and I Thank will you. present the recommendations from a Word document here. Give me just a second. Please. Could I ask a question while you're doing that? I just, should I just wait till you finish? Uh, can you wait just a second? Sure. Thank you. Okay. Can everyone see the uh, priorities there and the recommendations? Do I need to make it bigger? Bigger would be better. Bigger yeah. is better. Oops, that's too big, I believe. Let me just make that a little smaller. Too big. Yeah, that's much Sorry about better. that. Yes. All right. All right. So here is priority one. And these are the recommendations that were made. And so I'll let you look at those. It says examine what data could be collected to support request, recommend an examination of multiple data sources to support budget request, and identify data that could be collected to support priority number one, such as district caseloads. Those were the recommendations to KDE for priority number one. So we don't have, um, you know, a quorum today, but you can look at these and if there's any um, discussion, someone could make a motion for that and second it, and then we could have some discussion about recommendations for number one. And remind me what the motion would do. For us to have discussion or to edit. But I guess we can't vote on them, so perhaps that is something we need to just. So just could look we at just today. discuss? We can discuss, but we wouldn't be able to to vote on them, I guess. And I guess we can't make a motion. So, uh, well, uh, what ideas do you have on priority one? Suggestions for data that could be collected. I would tell you the legislators, especially the chair of the budget committee in the House, is they're very interested in data. And so to support the fact that 10 million is better than we had before, but it still is not what we need when we divide it across 171 school districts. Thoughts on data? I have uh, maybe a question. This is Pauline Covington, and uh -huh. I was wondering if the legislature has a template for how they would like to see budgets um, from different organizations or even a template of best practices or um, the most effective budget approval um, requests. Is there any type of information on that? I'm slow to answer because I'm thinking I am unaware of, of of such. I know that for this session, if you wanted to add anything to the budget, there was definitely a form to use. Um, my experience says that the best possible way to get something in the budget is to have it in the budget from the very beginning and I don't know of a template to do that. I do know that KDE sets its priorities for the budget that various organizations, the Kentucky <clears throat> Superintendents Association, the School Board Association, and other organizations that um, are active during the legislative session all have priorities and the best bet would be to be included with KDE's priorities and I think those come from the state school board. So my answer to you is I'm not sure but I don't think there is a form. Mm. 
Remember when they, um, I don't know if it was called the Green Book, but there was a, a, a reformation for how to handle money, especially for outside organ, school organizations or affiliations, um, just in way of keeping track of the money to keep it separate. Did that include some sort of budget format or ruling? Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, a few years ago, especially uh, for organizations like, I guess, PTAs or PTOs or boosters or all of those organizations, the best way to handle uh, the money. Did that include a budget requirement or any insights? I don't recall. It's, it's been a few years. I am unfamiliar with that. OK, uh, I'll just someone you. else may be, but not okay. I. It's. It's the red book. It's called red book. The red book. Okay. Red book. Yeah, that's, yeah. But I think that's like an unrelated. That's unrelated. really not the same as like that's more like yeah. house money handling. <laughs> like yeah, I, not really. Oh, they didn't say anything about budgeting. In how school, to handle the like budget in school organizations. Okay. Yeah. A red red book is just the financial procedures. Um, financial procedure requirements for money uh, with, you know, uh, arranged within schools. Uh, and it's used for the um, the annual school audits of the financial accounts. Mm -hmm. uh, however, there there is a template for an annual annual budget request. It isn't anything fancy. It's just an Excel spreadsheet. Um, but it, it that that's pretty much the layout. Uh, so it's just a an Excel spreadsheet that would include a breakdown of costs and then, of course, ultimately the total request. Byron, it's that a uh, Google sheet that KDE has? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yep. Yep, absolutely. And and I I'll have I'd be glad to just share what that looks like. Now pull it out of my files. And uh, again, it would just, it's not anything fancy. Uh, <laughs> it's just an Excel sheet, uh, but it's what um, is used to break down the annual budget request. So Byron, what would you suggest that our advisory group could do to uh, encourage a priority to be set to increase the budget for gifted? education. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great point. Um, you know, I think there are probably um, uh, a few routes to take. Um, certainly, uh, um, Dr. Roberts, as you mentioned, and I think we talked about last time, uh, there could be just something generated um, internally through uh, the appropriate KDE office and presented to the Kentucky Board of Education. Uh, that, that will be um, uh, not this year, but next year, uh, that usually would start uh, generating those in the spring of, let's see, let me get my, get my years right. So the next annual budget will be 26. So it would be the spring of 26. And usually um, in June, the June Kentucky Board of Education meeting of a budget year is when they sort of receive those. Um, and then they narrow them down uh, in uh, August to to October. So that would be that would be one route to take. And the, Byron, wouldn't that be the spring of twenty five? Or twenty five, correct? Yeah, sorry. Yes, twenty five. <laughs> yes, thank you. Because um, the session would begin January twenty six. So absolutely, twenty five. Thank you. Um, so it it's an early, as you could imagine, uh, there's an early jump on that um, to get it together. Uh, I think uh, potentially the next option, of course, would be to have uh, legislation sponsored um, and a line item budget item included with that uh, particular piece of legislation um, that is a direct sort of a more direct route into uh, the legislative process. Um, and then I, I'm not sure uh, as sort of external agencies, I'm not aware that there's any process. And Dr. Roberts, as you mentioned, some of, you know, our K groups, um, they, they pretty much uh, have to affiliate usually with the legislator 
uh, to try to get the budget included. I don't know of any route that an external agency can use to submit that. Um, and then, of course, there's always an ability to contact um, uh, the governor's office um, and, the, and the budget director's office uh, for guidance as well would be another route. And perhaps we want to look at all of those. Thank you, Byron. No, absolutely. Other thoughts on priority one? Pretty important. Well, I, let's look. Oh, go ahead. Excuse me, Dr. Roberts. I actually have a follow up question about the $10 million that was approved. In what, um, what was the way in which it was presented and uh, subsequently? Uh, sub subsequently approved? Was it uh, through the KDE um, uh, protocol? Was it through legislation or was it through the governor slash budget director's office? It was actually um, two of those. It, it was in the governor's budget and it was in the legislature. It was in the original budget the legislators put forth. There was one brief moment in time that it went up a tweak in the House budget, but that isn't how it ended up. Thank you. Anything else before we go to priority two? Priority one is incredibly important. It's, it's what supports us doing what we do. Priority two, educating teachers and parents on the identification recommendations for students showing gifted and talented educations. Uh, education, I, I am shocked on an ongoing basis by teachers I talk to who really know nothing about gifted ed. Um, haven't ever heard of a GSSP. Um, there is a huge education opportunity for us in the state. And if educators, and, and many times those are the decision makers, the principals, the superintendents who don't know about gifted ed. So it's a big lift that we really need to make. Um, the recommendation to KDE is to develop end of year report with questions focused on the following. How the district gathers recommendations. I'm not quite sure what that means. We'll have to clarify how your district implements identification. Um, how are gifted and talented resources utilized? and what questions are included on parent surveys. Comments or clarification on any of that? Um, did someone say before that there's a annual survey that we're using currently to get parents and teachers input on What's being done in the sea of, or was that the suggestion to have that? I thought when we were just dis, uh, discussing it, there was something being used already. Is that true, um, Kathy or Dr. Julia? So by regulation, Bryn, uh, districts have to have a program evaluation. Part of that uh -huh. annual program evaluation is they have to gather input from parents, students, and faculty members about the gifted program. And so it's mm -hmm. up to the districts about how they orchestrate that, though. Okay. So, okay. Um, and any, go ahead. Any oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say um, I, I I was one that helped with this on on our last meeting, and um, I think what we were trying to and 
and Miss Kathy, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think right now it is up to the district as to what questions you can ask your parents, teachers, and students. So the, like the coordinator, um, they have that freedom. And so we were just maybe suggesting if they if they could require a question about, um, you know, do, 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 do like if it's parents, do you know how to um, recommend a student or do you know where to go to to find this information at? Um, or if you go to teachers, like a specific, I ask maybe specific questions to address these possible issues. So I think that was kind of where we thought you could easily get data from that to see, hey, either they know or they don't know, and that could maybe just be an easy fix if it's in the PD that the uh, coordinators or the teachers are giving to to their regular ed teachers. So, um, but I, I could be wrong, but I believe it, as of right now, it's left up to the district what questions that you can, you can ask. That is mm -hmm. correct, Hannah. Those are all district decisions. Yeah, I think you're right. I think we worked on that as a group together. But uh, I was trying to see where we are now. I guess a suggestion for future. Um, I'm not sure if what they currently are doing is reported in the report card. And we could look at that for the districts to see what's already available, to see what changes need to occur. Is there a way we can find out uh, what questions some of the districts, if they're already doing a survey, what you say is required, it's just up to them what's asked. So how do we find out what they are asking? Is there some compilation? Uh, you can just contact your GT coordinator in your district, Brand, and you can ask what kind of questions are being, being asked, you know, what kind of feedback okay. that they're receiving. Okay, but there's no general place I could go and, and compare those um to what no. other schools are okay okay no, so no we don't get... collect that data here at kde no because like okay. i said you know we have 171 you know districts and so although mm -hmm. the regulation is the umbrella for which people have their policies and procedures like hannah said you know they make those decisions about what questions are um asked or how they even gather their input about um their programs so. so to to gain more clarification, this is Pauline Covington uh, regarding priority two. Is it correct in me um, saying that the reason or the rationale that we developed this priority is to understand the types of questions that are being asked of the parents and the teachers in order to further target recommendations on how we educate teachers and parents? That's a good question, Paulette. Um, it, the, way, the way our recommendations to KDE look right now, I, I can't remember everything about our meeting. It it sounds like that's the route we were trying to take. So if we look at the priority without the recommendations here, what would it suggest that we're recommending? This is a recommendation to KDE. How could we clarify what that could be? How would we um, hope that KDE could lead in professional learning related to gifted and talented children and gifted ed? Perhaps including the idea that there is a process period in identification and recommending students for GT identification. Um, perhaps that is a key factor. Again, 
including the idea of, ha- of the fact that there is a process that needs to happen. Um, because that notion could help teachers and parents start somewhere. Um, and whether it's initiated by the teacher, by the parent, um, that might be something that needs to be more explicit for districts to convey. And if I could say something, I'm I'm, I'm kind of like you. It's it's been a it's been a minute <laughs> since uh, uh, I can remember the conversations that were had. But I almost feel like as we're talking about this, like too, we were trying to figure out the needs of maybe or the gap of what teachers and educators don't know about gifted and maybe that was our stream of thinking of well let's collect the data on what they don't know or what they're unfamiliar about and then that could be a way that um kde or it, there could be something provided whether it's what or where wherever about those those gaps in the um, in understanding about it i'm not for sure but i believe that was maybe the the thinking that we had. We kind of had to had to work backwards to go forwards in a sense. I get that. Thank you. I would say that you who are on this call, who are on the advisory council, do know about gifted and your districts probably do. But priority to, to, to me would say, how do we get that word out across the state? Because if you are not um, recognizing gifted children as a category of exceptional children, and I know the gifted coordinators are, but I'm, I'm kind of doing a broader sweep to teachers, to decision makers. Um, how do we market? the fact that gifted children are a category of exceptional children and that all exceptional children in the law in Kentucky will have an individual education plan. For gifted, we've called it a gifted student services plan, but it is an IEP. How how do we market that? And to me, that's kind of what priority two would be talking about. How do we let parents and educators know about identification and recommendations for students who are gifted and talented? Well, it sounds like it, uh, this is Paul Lynn again, it sounds like it's going to require a mind shift for the Commonwealth, um, for the, for our average citizens. And I think in as much as special education is the way it's understood, at some point there may be in history, I'm not sure where at what point in history there was the mind shift for the need for special education services. And it wasn't until I became part of this council that Dr. Roberts helped me understand that twice exceptional students um, who are gifted and talented deserve and need services in as much as students who have special education needs um, and as much as they require or need those types or those particular services as well. Um, and in my in my experience as an educator at a at a school for creative and performing arts i come from a very unique situation because it's every day we experience that but also under that umbrella we do have special education services and we are so we're juggling both these um, 
both types of exposure and services. So, you know, I wonder with other schools, what does that look like? It sounds from my perspective that because there's such a strong letter of the law for special education services, we as practitioners seem more um, compelled because it is the law. And so I, I wonder, you know, at what point, I know that they're all students who are identified as GSSP, um, or they have to have a gifted and um, gifted service plan. But at what point is that shift going to happen for our Commonwealth to where educators and parents can advocate for um, services adequate for their child? And to me, Paulette, that's really what priority two is talking about. How do we raise the level of recognition? How does KDE do that uh, for us? Because these are recommendations for KDE. And we certainly want to work and help that happen. Mm -hmm. I think Brandy Corbin's got her hand up, Dr. Oh, Robert. well. Brandy. I do. I, so kind of when I read that priority, I feel like the words that are important in there are showing gifted and talented characteristics. And when we start talking about, you know, comparing gifted services plans and, you know, or gifted students and special education students, the characteristics and criteria for being um, identified as special education are are very clear. You know, there are clear criteria for that. There are certain measures that have to be considered to determine if you are um, going to receive special education services or not, whereas the ones for gifted and talented are um, not nearly as clear. They're much more gray. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, I think in terms of priority number two, the part that is stands out to me as needing some clarification is what are those characteristics and if we're going to you know kind of compare our gifted and talented students to the same services received for special education that those characteristics are going to have to be set as criteria and we have to have some kind of measure that determines whether or not students meet that criteria You've made a very important point. Um, and if we look at gifted in Kentucky, we're looking at least at five different categories, which really become more categories than that in that right. specific academic areas, at least four. The visual and performing arts would be multiple areas. Um, it makes it more challenging, but right. there are certainly characteristics that we can look for in each of those categories of giftedness. And I would have to say that I, I think many educators don't see the need with gifted students being served as they do with special education students. And that need is complicated by the fact that the need is created by the strength for gifted students. And consequently, to many people, that would not look needy. But that is what makes it different and makes it so that accommodations are important if that child is to make continuous progress. I agree. I just think that it hasn't really been made clear what, you know, like I said, when you are a special education student, there are criteria that have been set to determine those services and the level of service and by law what services you are to receive. And that is not as clear for gifted and talented students. Correct. 
And I don't know how we educate teachers and expect teachers to do, you know, kind of what we're asking in terms of identification, making sure that we're going through a, a great identif identification process whenever the criteria is not clearly defined. I see another hand, but I can't see the face because the hand covers my face. So if you have your hand up, please oh. share. Oh, okay, it's Brad Martin. I know I had mine, and so if there's somebody else too, they can go ahead. But I, I um, think it's you, Brad. Okay, <laughs> I wanted to respond to the question of how do we get that word out. Um, I was thinking when we go back to school, uh, that's a good time. I know our school a long time ago did a a questionnaire that accompanied a lot of the other forms that we had to do, and it had information about how you think your child best learn, um, what are they, you know, their favorites, their like, but it was something that was a part of the GSSP right around the time they started it. So I'm not sure how many schools are doing that. That would be good to know too. But I think that's a good time, that back to school packet of information, that that form is a part of that. And then the school letters, make sure that information is in there, let the parents know to look for it and make sure they know how important it is and how useful it is, it is to complete that and get that back uh, to the coordinators. Uh, also, I think if we have it in the KY teacher magazine, have them to do a little blurb on that or to re highlight that sheet. You know, it's a part of the other forms because parents get so many forms, but they need to understand, you know, why that's important and why there are so many questions on that. And then I think if we do a, a, a KET special, see if they'll do something on the gifted and talented uh, curriculum, the process, the identification and remind them about the GSSP. And, and again, that form. So if we could do that close to the beginning of the year, that would be awesome, too. Thank you. Other thoughts on priority two? And I think the question there is what can KDE do to do this? Let's look at priority three support equitable funding for all socioeconomic and geographic groups in all districts. As I look at that, I'm thinking that's a KDE decision on how the $10 million are allocated. Is that right? There is a calculation for that, Dr. Roberts. I, I know there is. And, and why don't you share that, Kathy? Okay. So uh, each district receives um, $20,000. And then uh, they also receive a per pupil uh, amount based on their total population from the previous school year. And that's per pupil identified as gifted or in the district? No, total number of students in the district. Yeah, I thought it was that way. And it's that looking K to 12? Yes. So if that's the formula, what's priority three all about? What, what's our recommendation? These are recommendations for KDE. So what's that asking? If I remember correctly, this is Lindsay. I feel like some of the discussion around this was like, not just like that, obviously that formula is fair at face value, but when you're looking at gifted students in Lexington have a lot more opportunity for going to see plays or going to see the orchestra or going to see different things than, I don't know, a far western Kentucky county or a far eastern Kentucky county or even my little county. So I think it was more about like availability for resources based on 
where they were. Like, I remember some discussion around that, at least from our last meeting. And so what would the suggestion be to KDE? I'm not sure. I would think that there would need to be some extra funding, but I don't really know how you, I don't know how you would, how you would, I'm not sure how you would ever decide on a formula for like, well, this little county can't get to, you know, Lexington as easily as this county. So how much money more money do they need? I'm not sure how you quantify that exactly. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's something else they have to include. I'm sorry, am I talking out the term? Uh, maybe that's something else they would need to include to factor in, or we're suggesting they factor in to consider accessibility uh, to events, uh, to consider the closeness to events, you know, um, whether some of those smaller schools are getting enough funding to um, offer uh, some of the things that some of those bigger areas are able to offer. Or are they able to even get to some of those locations because of, you know, transportation costs to get the bus over there and all of that? So maybe uh, that would be factored in. Um, also, I wanted to say, are we sure we want to use the word uh, equitable now? It has been under such attack uh, with a lot of the uh, bills that came out of Frankfurt. You know, a lot of the DI bills are, are you know, trauma informed bills. All of and all of those key words are being targeted uh, to where sometimes they're just doing searches on some of the words and kicking, you know, kicking stuff out. Um, do y'all want to talk about that or? Also, I think some schools. I'm not sure if Kentucky is flagging the word socioeconomic, um, but the conference I was just in in, in DC with Ed Trust, uh, where we went with Pritchard, uh, some of some of them are facing uh, anything that dealt with socioeconomic, uh, diversity, exclusion, inclusion, <laughs> belonging. All of those uh, key words are 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 tossing out things that try to uh, uh, target that so that it could be dealt with. It's important input. Is equitable funding a phrase that would be considered along with equity? It kind of seems different to me, but um, you've been in this conversation very recently, so mm. may, may, maybe so. I see another hand up, but when the hand goes up, the face is gone for me on my screen. So if you have a hand up, please speak out. Yes, this is Hannah, and this this could be a very um, ignorant question of me because I'm not for sure, but um, does KDE have the leeway whenever you give the 20,000 to districts? Um, and I notice it kind of goes with the second bullet point here. Like if you, I don't know, does that have to be used on salaries or can you protect it in a way to where it cannot be used on salaries, but that 20,000 can be used? Like, is there stipulations for that? Um, and that that might be KDE might say there's nothing we can do about that. That might be a district decision um, because I'm you know, I've, I've heard before, like, you know, like that's not even enough to cover one salary of a gifted um, person. But I was just like, if there's a way that with this allocated funds that we could protect at least some of it to designate it for oh. services. So therefore, if you have a county who might be greedy and might not want to allocate it or might figure out a way to reroute it um, that it would at least have some protection. And that, like I said, I don't know where that's at because I am i don't know a lot about with the budgeting, but um, that was just a question I had. Good question, Hannah. So that's a good question, um, Hannah. So 
you know, it's the 20,000 and plus the per people amount that goes out to the district. And so then the districts have to use, according to regulation, 75 percent of mm -hmm. that allocation to hire certified uh, staff to provide services to GG students. And so it's up to the district about uh, the other, you know, that's the minimum they can spend on hiring staff to provide services. And the, you know, they can use all of it if, if they want to. So it's up to, to answer your question, it's up to districts uh, how they spend that money according to the regulation. And so many districts after that 75 is spent, um, you know, they they don't seem to have uh, very much left over for for other things, um, but uh, it's up to districts how that money is spent according to the regulation is the is my answer I believe. You have any follow up okay. questions for that, Hannah? Uh, thank you. Well, I just you know speaking with some of the other gifted coordinators across the state, like they wear multiple hats, and so you think if that 75 allocation is for a certified GT person, but yet they're wearing other hats in the district, like where that money is going, um, just just that's just kind of where I thought you know if because I mean I trust my district and I'm sure you all trust your districts, but I, I fear that you know they're probably are some districts out there that are not utilizing the funds as it should be but now like I said I don't know and um, how they can write that up to look but but yes that answers my question thank you Miss Kathy right and so um, kind of as a follow-up to that you know there are um, all of the the funds uh, that are allocated to districts are out on the KDE state grant website so that that's transparent, that people can see how much each district is uh, allocated. And then, uh, you know, if a district wants to ensure uh, that those funds are, funds are being spent correctly, especially the GT coordinator in each district, you know, that's their responsibility to work with their finance officer to make sure that those funds are being spent correctly. There are, there, there is also a non-competitive matrix code on the state grant website and it tells how those monies have to be spent. And uh, right up there at the very beginning, it says 75% has to be spent using such and such code, you know, to hire a GT staff. And so, you know, if uh, a district wants to ensure that that money's being, you know, correctly spent, they could get with their uh, finance officer to have those conversations with them about that. Um, I think uh, in looking at bullet number two there, I think uh, uh, one of the advisory council members was wanting to talk about that 75% mm -hmm. and maybe there be a, uh, looks like she says regulation, uh, current regulation, you know, looking at that to see if there would be a way to, um, like you were talking about, have different stipulations on how that money could be spent, but that would take a regulation change, you know. The advisory council at the last meeting voted on these three priorities, right, Kathy? Correct. We voted on the priorities, but but not the recommendations. And I don't believe we have enough, unless there's people who've come on since we started talking, to vote on the recommendations. But we've had a good discussion about them. So. Is this the last meeting of this year? Yes, this is the last meeting of this school year. So may I recommend that these three priorities, not the recommendations under them, be communicated to the new superintendent when, or new commissioner when he arrives July 1? Not that we communicated on July 1, but he arrives on July 1. Um, I believe that would take a motion, Dr. Roberts, and since we don't have a quorum, we can't make a motion for that. Uh, but um, so, Misty, am I correct about that? Yes. We can just take note and bring it up and pivot on the agenda at the next meeting. Okay. I have a question. Oops. I have a question. 
Yes. yes go ahead. Thank you. Can we maybe make a motion, take a vote on that through email? Um, I don't believe so. I believe we have a meeting. Misty, you can correct me on that. I think you have to have a quorum. Um, correct in order to make any kind of voting types of things, Kim. Hi, Kathy. Um, this is Melody Cooper. I'm the policy advisor for the Office yeah. of Special Education and Early Learning. And yeah. I don't think um, email action would comply with the Open Meetings Act. So, no, we wouldn't be able to do that. Thank you, Melody. Appreciate that. Thank you for the question, though, Kim. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another option might be uh, an invitation uh, to join the group uh, for for a meeting. Correct. And we certainly can do that for our next meeting. Right. And that's one of the things we try to do for each each meeting. We let them know when the future meeting dates are coming up, and then we let them know when those are. We let uh, the ad the administration person for the new commissioner know when those dates will be and they'll be invited to all those. Unfortunately, we can look at the dates and y'all can put them on your calendar, but we won't be able to vote on those until the next meeting. So, so I, I'm speaking only from history here, not from current expectations, but historically the advisory council reported to the commissioner on what had been decided and sent that on to the state board. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure we didn't vote to do that. It was just what was expected to report for the year. We established these priorities. So, um, okay, so I think we looked at the priorities and that the next thing on the agenda we can't do, and that's elect officers without um, a, a quorum. Correct. So I think we're to legislative update. And Melody, I've heard you speak out, so I know you're here. Okay. Uh, the next thing is future meeting dates. So before Melody gets to that, I'll just uh, show you some of these dates here. And if you want to jot those down, you can. I looked to see, you know, if the State Advisory Council, I mean, the KDE boardroom was available, and it does, these did seem to be uh, available dates for that. Uh, so th those were Wednesday, September the 14th, Wednesday, December 4th, Tuesday, February the 11th, and we tr I tried to combine that with the Gifted Education Proclamation. Did I get that date correct, Dr. Roberts, February think, the 11th? Oh, actually, that's been changed. Oh, okay. Um, what is that it, been changed? To? It will be that Thursday the thirteenth. Okay. Miss Kathy, do you mind me asking if all of these are whether they're in person or virtual, or have you has that been planned yet? Um, we have not planned that yet. I guess we were going to have a discussion of that today. So, but we'll have to table that till our next meeting since we don't have, you know, a quorum to vote on that. But we'll come back to that in the fall. Um, uh, and we could just set a tentative date, you know, to meet so that y'all can put that on your calendar. Um, Dr. Roberts, does that look like a good date for you? You can get back to me on that if you don't know today. September the 14th. Sounds like a great day. Okay. Well, we'll tentatively set, uh, set that then as the September 14th, since we can't vote on that today then. All right. Now we can move on to our legislative update by Melody Cooper, who's our policy advisor. Handing over to you, Melody. Welcome, I think someone Melody. had their hand up first for with a question. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Kim? Yeah, sorry. So is the is the default for the for our meetings to be in person? 
And then if we go virtual, is that a vote or do we have to vote on each type of meeting where we're going to hold it? Either virtually or in person. So Kim, by regulation, the advisory council only has to meet a minimum of two times, mm -hmm. but we have uh, met more than that. And so in order to um, be flexible, we've tried to meet uh, two times in person and two times virtually to accommodate people's schedules. So we can talk about that more in September when we get back together. Good question. Any other questions? All right, we'll move on forward then with Melody Cooper. All right, good morning, everyone. I am uh, Melody Cooper, for those of you I have not met, and I'm the policy advisor here in OSEAL. Um, I've been really, you know, enjoying the conversation this morning, so glad to be here with you. Uh, as everyone knows, we wrapped up the legislative session on April 15th, and so everything, I know the last time I gave an update, um, I guess to say, Peck, there were still some bills before the governor to sign, but everything, I think everything is wrapped up now. He's either signed or, or vetoed everything that was before him at this point. So uh, we'll go ahead and get in. You can, you can advance to the next slide. Okay, so we'll start with House Bill 6, which was the budget bill. And so there were, um, you know, several things in there that we were that we were pleased about or interested to, to follow and, and find out more about as time goes on. So there was an increase uh, that had long been advocated for an increase in SEEK funding. And so that was included this time. And um, also SEEK transportation funding was increased. The interesting thing is that, you know, a big conversation throughout the state, it's been, you know, long been trying to increase salaries for certified and classified district staff and so language was included um, there's nothing required but language is included in house bill six that would encourage districts to kind of use that seek increase to also increase salaries for their district staff we maintained the full day kindergarten funding there was an allocation for a star academy pilot program this is one of those i don't have a lot of information about it but i'm interested to see where it goes the the way it's worded in the budget bill is that it it is charter it's a charter school that would be housed within a public school and this is a three-year pilot program that would be in five locations across the state that's that's the wording that's in the budget bill so I don't know anything further about it other than that. There was some funding included for school resource officers. Now, this was not, it's not a fully funded thing. It would, it um, requires KDE to assist with the salaries on a reimbursement basement basis, which would be up to 20000 for each campus with a full-time school resource officer on site. Uh, there was also some language requiring, you know, districts to post their uh, reading and math results from the Kentucky academic uh, or Kentucky. Sorry, I just blanked on it. Kentucky summative assessments. Is that right? KSA? I just like completely blanked on that. Um, and so and then also KDE would be required to post a rank order posting of those proficient and distinguished scores in reading and math. Now, House Bill 1 was a different budget bill that some of you may have been following and been familiar with, where they um, uh, they they used this one to address more kind of like one off needs that they were using for, you know, extending things on an emergency basis or, or paying things that would be a one time expenditure and uh, use like the rainy day fund. So there was in House Bill 1, they included 2.5 million for KDE to purchase um, automated external defibrillators, <laughs> AEDs, for the public schools. Okay. Any questions on that one before I move on? All right. Next slide then. 
All right, so then for OCL specific for our office, there was, um, we maintained everything for the KSB and the KSD for operating funds and capital projects were maintained. And then there was a slight increase that they include for the step and rank change for staff there at those schools. And then our learning and results services programs, which we call our LARS items, they all maintained their funding there. So we have the state funded preschool, extended school services and gifted and talented, which I know you're aware of, maintained funding from the previous budget bill. All right, next slide. Then these, uh, this funding was not, there were a few items in there that are for our education partners. And so not work done directly by KDE, but it is really, you know, still good news. So the Cabinet for Health and Family Services received some funding there for um, some additional funding for family resource youth service centers to help out in those locations where they're uh, trying to serve multiple schools. Then the Kentucky Higher Education Assistance Authority, I'll talk a little bit more about this in the bill that's um, related to it in, in, a pre, in one of my subsequent slides, but there was some funding to try to um, increase our educator pipeline, you know, to um, uh, recruit and retain more teachers. And so there's um, some pilot programs here for teacher scholarship program, and then also a student teacher stipend program, which Dr. Darnell could probably give us even more information about that if needed, if anybody has questions about that. And then there was an amount for the auditor of public accounts for a, an audit of the Jefferson County Public Schools. All right, any questions there before I move on? Okay, next slide then. All right, and so all of these bills, like I said, we're not waiting for anything else from the governor at this point. So um, everything that we had been watching here, it was enacted. If you see a little star beside it, it means that it was enacted with an emergency clause. And of course, when they are enacted, it could be done in a few different ways. It was either you know, signed by the governor, it could have become law without his signature if he decided to not sign it, but also not try to impose a veto. And then um, it could have also become law by overriding a veto of the governor. So those are the three ways that it could be enacted. And so uh, I mentioned that those with the star were enacted with an emergency clause, which means they take effect immediately. If they did not have the emergency clause, then they will take effect July 15th. That date was released um, last week, that it would be July 15th. All right, so Senate Bill 2, uh, there was a lot of conversation about this one uh, with the student safety and mental health. And so they added language where districts may hire, and it's optional, they're not required to do so, but they may hire something called guardians, which would be similar but different to a school resource officer, kind of some different, um, different requirements around that. And that, that kind of thing would all be handled through the Center for School Safety. So it just gives districts another option if they're having trouble funding those school resource officers because they can uh, guardians, I believe, can even be volunteers if needed, but there are certain requirements still that they would have to meet. Uh, there were some positive things in Senate Bill 2 around mental health. There was um, trauma-informed team. There was some information about that. They added a required suicide prevention lesson. So there was already one required for districts to give, but they've added a second requirement so by September 15th and January 15th, each school year, districts provide to students a suicide prevention lesson. And then uh, there was also an optional school mapping data program added in, some language around that. And this would be on a volunteer basis, and it would be through the Center for School Safety again. But it's... Um, it's something where they're looking to assist first responders if there is some kind of emergency call for a school. Let's see. Um, 
Okay, so that was Senate Bill 2. All right, Senate Bill 11. This was the juvenile justice. This is trying to reduce that time, the window of time that could be given um, between a charge being filed against a student and then the school bit being made aware of that. And there was language included too that if something happens with the charge where it's dismissed or diverted in some way, that the district would also be required to expunge the student's records of anything referencing uh, the charges. Senate Bill 167 is a requires for a uh, course of handwriting to become a course of study in elementary school, beginning with the 25-26 school year. There was Senate Bill 267, that's one of those with the emergency clause, and it's uh, dealing with the all option seven alternative certification pathway where they're just reducing some of the barriers for obtaining that certification and then also for districts to hire teachers through that alternative pathway. Did I get that right, Dr. Darnell? <laughs> and uh, the, they did also add some mentorship language that kind of um, is reminiscent of the old KTIP program. There, it, there's no funding attached to it right now, but we'll see where that goes, you know, how districts are able to, um, I think the EPSB will be looking into some guidance around that. House Bill 2 also got a lot of conversation. That's the ballot language for the constitutional amendment that would allow public funds to support non-public school education. So right now, this will be on the ballot in November where voter, voters will get to make that decision. If it's ratified, then further action will be needed at the General Assembly level so that they can decide, you know, what that's what that would look like. So that'll be right now. It's just language on the ballot that voters will see in November. House Bill, House Bill 142 is around products that contain nicotine and va vaping. So schools will be required to provide some educational materials. And then there are some disciplinary actions that are laid out in that bill. But some of those also are optionals. Uh, it was a little stricter at first, and then it evolved some so that it allowed still more district flexibility on the way they would want to impose some disciplinary actions. House Bill 162 is the numeracy bill, which is trying to do some similar work to the Read to Succeed Act that was passed in sub in previous years. Um, and I believe that one is a, I, they started with grade four through eight, but then I believe it, it evolved to K through eight or K through five. Now, now I'm not remembering. I saw right. Dr. Donna, I saw that you unmuted Dr. Donna, Dr. Donna. Yes. <laughs> Excuse me. Did I get it? Okay. Um, right. So, yes. And then House Bill 169, that's, I'm not going to say the AED, that whole thing again. I trip up every time. So, that's where that funding comes in because it's AEDs will be required in all school buildings and at school sanctioned athletic practices and competitions. The House Bill 300 sets some timelines for the EPSB, the Education Professional Standards Board, for investigating in educator misconduct. All right, next slide. There were, there were a lot. There were several bills that we had um, education related this year. You can advance to the next slide. All right, and then House Bill 377. So that's what I talked about earlier with the PIA funding for that teacher recruitment and retention, those two initiatives. House Bill 446, um, it requires districts to adopt a transportation services policy, which is basically like a discipline, a transportation discipline policy. House Bill 447 is a bill where they're giving districts the options to, again, it's an option, not a requirement, to use passenger vehicles for transporting students to and from school. I think, um, you know, our general feeling is that school buses are the safest way for students to be transported, but there are some districts who struggle, I guess, with really rural routes and where possibly pass those, like, think those big nine passenger vans. Um, could be put to use for that purpose. House Bill 695 is the Adaptive Kindergarten Readiness Pilot Project. 
Now, this one, uh, KDE would implement this, this project. It's basically an online enrichment activity that's designed to boost students' kindergarten readiness. So this would be available for students who are not currently enrolled in kindergarten, but would be eligible to enroll in kindergarten the following year. And again, this is a pilot, and so it would not be um, a statewide implementation right away. We don't have a lot of information yet about what that pilot project would look like. But um, there's also some language in there where um, we're saving some of the pilot membership for kids who are um, up to 200% of the federal poverty level, and then families who are up to 400% of the per federal poverty level could also receive the hardware and the internet access needed for the program. Um, it's supposed to also promote family engagement as well. So it would be um, kind of targeted to kids through the early childhood education avenues that are out there now for for making those selections. But again, I don't I don't have a lot of specific information about that yet, but KDE would be implementing that pilot project. Uh, House Bill 387 is about substitute teacher certification. This is an again creates another option for districts, not a requirement, but in districts where they're really struggling to find substitute teachers, there are some instances where they could um, accept substitute teachers who have a high school diploma. And then there are also some things about extending some of that certification for substitute teachers in certain instances. So if they were to meet certain requirements, because right now or in the past, it's been a year to year certification. And so there's some they'll have some options for extending that certification. Uh, House Bill 449 relates to local boards of education, making it easier for them to um, prove, I guess, that they they have a high school diploma. This is where in some places the high school may have been closed that somebody graduated from and they can't obtain their high school diploma or any kind of records. And so they can they can sign an affidavit to prove that. The 499 is around the career and technical education funding distribution formula and also sets some quality requirements for receiving funding. So that's great. Uh, I include this medicinal cannabis bill on here because it does impact districts. Districts will be required to set a policy either allowing or not allowing the administration of medicinal cannabis on school property. And then House Concurrent Resolution 81 did go through, and that's the Efficient and Effective School District Governance Task Force. Um, which is geared toward districts with an enrollment of greater than 75,000 students. So that's one district in, in uh, Kentucky. Oh, and then I think I skipped over House Bill 825, but that one um, will have the Kentucky Department of Education go through an audit process this year or this, this coming year. Any questions on those? All right, so last slide. I think everybody is aware that um, Dr. Fletcher, Fletcher was confirmed. Um, this was the first time, it was interesting to watch the process, I thought, because it was the first time we've ever had a commissioner who's been subject to that confirmation process through the Senate. And so he will begin on July 1. All right, I think that's, that's it for great. me. So. Yes, I think he's from an area near us, Lawrence County. That's yes, right he's currently the superintendent County, which Lawrence is County. next to my green County. Yeah. Um, so looking forward to getting to see what he does and uh, hoping he doesn't get tossed out like they've done the rest, even though, you know, we've had some good people. But um, I'm well, sorry, maybe uh, tossed out wasn't the right word. <laughs> well, yeah, you're right. He was the he's the current superintendent of Lawrence County, and he also serves as the chair. He's currently the chair of the um, local superintendent advisory council that um, looks at all the materials and, and kind of comments and makes recommendations before they go to before different items go before the Kentucky Board of Education. So he's the chair of that right now. Oh, okay. uh, he's been involved with our Kentucky United We Learn Council. You know, he's he's really had a lot of involvement 
here at KDE before this time. So we're excited to uh, get to work with him. So, Melody, I have just a couple of comments. One of the things that I was happy for in this session was the advanced placement funding had been taken out of the budget, but was restored in the final budget. I think that message is incredibly important that we keep funding for AP testing there so that that is an option. The other thing, and this did not pass, but it was introduced, and I think it will have some momentum moving forward, and that was Senate Bill 360, which is about advanced coursework. Um, Senator West is sponsoring that. That came forward through the Pritchard Committee, but I was very excited about it because <laughs> that's one of the things that I think we're lacking in the state, and that's lots of advanced coursework. And Senate Bill 360 uh, didn't gain momentum, but it does have sponsorship. And I do believe as we move forward that it will have momentum. So didn't pass, but I hope you'll be looking for that and supporting it as we move forward. Yes, thank you for that. Yes, interesting stuff to see what's going to come in the interim as well. Great, thank you. Could I add to that also? Uh, thank you for bringing that up, Dr. Roberts. Uh, I just came from Washington, D.C. with a Pritchard Committee um, on behalf of Ed Trust, and we got a chance to meet with Senator, um, I'm sorry, Representative McGarvey, uh, and some more people and um, uh, the U.S. Board of Education. And that was one of the main things we were bringing up. Uh, Bridget talked uh, very well about that. And of course, I got a chance to mention our esteemed Dr. Roberts uh, uh, as the Gatton founder and uh, gifted and talented world uh, leader who is in much support of this bill. So I definitely touted that. And uh, they, they had already heard of you, Dr. Roberts. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> so they seemed uh, interested and very supportive of the concept. Well, to me, advanced coursework goes right along with gifted ed. It's, it's making sure that our students have opportunities to learn at an advanced level so they'll be prepared for what comes after that. Uh, we always must remember that as we have an emphasis on proficiency, that's average. And so that's not good enough for students who are already there or beyond that. So as we advocate for legislation and funding, all students need to be included in our hopes and dreams and plans. And that includes kids who are ready to learn at a faster pace and a more complex level. And that's advanced coursework. Absolutely. And whenever some of the other uh, leaders that were uh, accompanying us, there was maybe like six or seven of us uh, from Kentucky and uh, several, uh, many more across the state, um, they would mention about uh, disability uh, students and how helpful it would be. And so I would add that a lot of people don't realize that uh, some students with disabilities are also gifted, what we call twice exceptional. So they gave me a chance to enlighten them because some of them hadn't even heard of that. So it was it was some really good information shared and excitement. Thank you, Brent. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Melody. We need to be up to date. We need to yes. know what, you, what is and maybe uh, I've added what we hope for. All right. Well, thanks for having me. I was glad to be with you this morning. Thank, thank you, you so Melody. much. Thank you. All right. Well, next up on our agenda is our own Dr. Kimberly Nettleton. She's going to give us a CAGE update. Go ahead, Kim, whenever you're ready. Okay, well, since our last meeting in February, we, the CAGE um, has had their, their annual conference in Lexington. It was very well intended. The, the only thing that I saw at the conference that was not well attended was by parents. And so um, we need to 
kind of make sure that parents get the word out that here's a place that they can go and find out more about their their children. Um, but that is really where we are. I mean, that's a really small update as far as the um, cage right now. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll move on to closing remarks in by uh, Dr. Roberts. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Can I, can I interject just for a second? Uh, Dr. Sure. Nelton, um, is there, are you all planning to have a summer update this, this summer coming up in June? Um, there, that is under discussion right now. Um, they're okay. looking at holding, um, they're looking at holding the fall conference, maybe in the east and in the west, um, maybe on the same day with the same topics, but holding it where it's more central to people who may not be able to get to to Lexington for a, for a full day. Um, and the summer, I have not heard of any dates right now. They're going to try to have um, parent, like online parent nights uh, a couple of times during the summer on different topics, um, but that's currently that's all I know about. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hannah, I might add to that on September the 7th, we'll do the gifted education update. That's a Saturday and we'll do that virtually and that's co-sponsored by CAGE and the Center for Gifted Studies at WKU. I will also add that the CAGE conference is February 10th and 11th, and the proclamation, as Kathy mentioned, uh, it is on February 13th. So there's a day in between the CAGE conference and the proclamation signing. Um, so if I could provide a little bit of other information about what's going to be available. Um, Bren mentioned twice exceptional learners and on October 23rd, we'll be hosting at the Center for Gifted Studies, a one day workshop on twice exceptional learners and Dr. Susan Baum, one of the best in the country, will be here doing that. And it is so important for teachers who have a twice exceptional student, parents who are have a twice exceptional student to be a team and to learn together about what are strategies to let that student thrive. The other workshop the Center for Gifted Studies will hold in the fall is what we call our BERTA workshop. And Andy McNair is coming for that. She'll be talking about general strategies to ensure that students thrive in classrooms. So it's for classroom teachers as well as for gifted uh, resource teachers. Um, and that's on September the 24th. So those are two days that we have. Um, last session, I mentioned that the initial standards for teachers of gifted students was close to being finalized. It is final and the uh, Council for Exceptional Children will be uh, marketing that announcing those new standards for teachers of gifted children. Now that's different from the programming standards that NHEC has for what happens in gifted programs, but it is really important that we have standards because that's what others look for in a field and we certainly want to be up to date. And for those initial teacher standards, I've been co-chair of that and it's been almost a three year endeavor. So I must tell you, I'm pretty excited that CEC says it's final that uh, here we go. It's it's at the announcement stage. I have um, talked to Kathy a little bit about this. Um, the MTSS standards that uh, we had previously, the model included gifted children in it, and the current one 
does not. I know other states have done that, and I certainly would like to see Kentucky's model be one that looks at children who are exceptional in terms of their gifts and talents, as well as children who have uh, disabilities that need to be supported and nurtured. And Kathy, correct me if I'm saying anything there that is not current. Um, that is really uh, a good question, Dr. Roberts. I, I know there is language in there about advanced learners, um, and there is a lot of uh, really good resources there on the MTS website, um, but that is not housed in the Office of Special Education and Early Learning. So that's something that, you know, uh, we can look, look into more uh, next year. So being in the model would be really important for communicating that it fits, right? Well, as I said, there is uh, some language in there about advanced learners, but I'm not really familiar with uh, the whole MTSS uh, site. It's a huge uh, web page with many resources and videos, so um, that's something to look into in the future. So perhaps all of us on the council could take that as something that we need to know more about, and I certainly need to know more about it too. Okay. Um, I'm involved with a special issue of Gifted Child today that will focus the issue on MTSS for gifted students. So uh, we'll have some resources, but I hope we can get Kentucky um, specifically involved with that before that special issue comes out. There is so much going on in the conversation about education, about what our gifted and talented children are capable of doing. And I think being advocates for these children is not only the work of members of the council, but others across the Commonwealth of Kentucky. All decisions would be enhanced if we ask what would this decision mean to children with disabilities and what would it mean to children with gifts and talents. Um, everyone deserves the opportunity to be learning every day in school. I am happy that each of you is here today. I wish we had had a quorum to complete the rest of the items that are on the agenda, but that didn't happen on this beautiful spring day. But I am glad that you've been here and that we've had the discussions that we have been able to experience today. I have nothing else to say. Does anyone else want to make a comment before we adjourn? So before we adjourn, I think Kirk Haynes joined us today. Is that right, Kirk? Are you there with us today? Good morning, all. I misread the time. Sorry, I'm converting between Eastern and Central time. So my apology for my tardiness. No problem. No problem. Okay. I'm glad to see you, Kirk. Kirk. It's good to see all of you all. Thank you. All right. Does I just that give to... us a quorum? Unfortunately not. We had nine, okay. but not ten. But is there anybody else that, that came on a little bit later that maybe I missed? Okay. All right. Well, Misty, I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay. Um, this is just a reminder to check your email and, <clears throat> excuse me, and complete your exit slip about the meeting today. And that is all I had, but I look forward to seeing you in September. Thank you, Misty. Thank you for everybody for coming today. Hope you have a good rest Thank of you. the school year. Bye. Goodbye.